Welcome to the Faith and Reason podcast on Paving the Way Home. I'm your host, Kevin O'Driscoll, and today we're joined in studio by Father Philip Mulrain. Father, welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Good to be here. That's great to have you. So uh, would you like to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your, your background and how you came to be here? So. Okay, so, um, so now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Dominican friar in, in Pope's Key in Cork. Um, I'm in charge of the novices there, Master of Novices. Um, I've been ordained a priest three years, but prior to that, I'm from the north, from Belfast. Uh, but prior to my ordination and studying for priesthood, I was a professional soccer player for 14 years in England, going back right really from 1994 when I signed for Manchester United and spent six years there. And then um, spent six years at a team called Norwich City. Um, and then Cardiff City for a little while, and then I went to America for a little while after that. And I suppose just... Um, was brought up Catholic in my family, kind of a normal Catholic home, but I suppose like many people kind of drifted away from the faith, um, especially because the world that I was living in with regards to soccer and stuff, very powerful, um, that really materialistic world that the soccer life brings with it, and kind of just sort of drifted away from the practice of my faith for the majority of my 20s. And then in, in my late 20s, I would say due to a number of people, but primarily my sister and other members of my family, and then some good football friends that I had as well who were still practicing their faith just had a, a tremendous influence on me at that in that time my late 20s and um i just i suppose grew dissatisfied with the, like kind of footballer lifestyle and um even though i enjoyed enjoyed it so much immensely and it was a great privilege and then started to ask maybe deeper questions and then um my sister really came on board there and started to send me books and on the catholic faith and started to pray again and in 2009 i decided to come home for a few months just take a break from from soccer and come home and I came home and really everything changed there. I, my sister got me volunteering in the Legion of Mary hostel and I was in a, a number of prayer groups and um, just everything changed really. I had a, a number of, I suppose, deep experiences that completely reoriented my life, you know. And um, I made the decision then after six months of being at home to, uh, I suppose, officially retire from my football career at the age of 29, 30, I think it was. And um, it was in the course of that six months to a year that I started to feel the the stirrings of a vocation to priesthood and I originally started out in the studying for the diocese to be a diocesan priest for Down and Connor and spent three years in the seminary and then joined the Dominicans in 2012 and did my formation in Cork and in Dublin and then after ordination I was sent to Newbridge College as a chaplain and then appointed to Cork last year so I've been here just under a year. Right oh mm -hmm. very good and just because everyone has a different um sorry and we we've, we've had father colin Mannion on a few weeks ago talking about vocation he was you know as the vocations director and you know we're kind of everyone's calling is it feels different and things like that but after that we've got a few calls and and kind of inquiries on paving the way home um just different people brian had also spoken on paving the way home about his mm. vocation and people have kind of um I think they contact a brain instead of contacting a priest because it's like uh, asking, you know, about uh, about vocation because it's like they're afraid. I think if they ask a priest, it's like they're signed up. Whereas they kind of say, "Oh, uh, yeah." <laughs> sure, sure. But um, but just for you that mm. that six month period, what's you're saying that stirring? What what's mm. that kind of what's it feel like? Yeah, it's interesting. Really, it's kind of if I look back now, there's some very pivotal moments. But I think what the Lord does is, you know. If we, th if we think about, say we're talking about a religious vocation or a mm. vocation to priesthood, so you're talking about uh, vows of celibacy and obedience and, and poverty as well, if you're talking about religious life. And, you know, these are um, these are supernatural realities, you know. Yeah. It's not natural for the human being to be um, alone or to take a vow of celibacy. It's natural for the human being to marry and to, yeah. uh, and to and, and the fruit of that marriage with children and so forth. It's natural to the human being to to need material things for life and you know and to accrue certain things and it's natural with our own self-will to want to direct our lives in union with god and so forth and things like that so when we're talking about the, the vows this is why the lord says in the god in matthew you know 19 he who has received this call you know let him let him have it or let him listen you know yeah. um you know in that, in that sense it's a supernatural reality that doesn't go against human nature, but it's something that doesn't come from within human nature. It's not natural to want these things. Yeah. So if you start to feel an attraction, like a, and more than an attraction, like a in many ways for me it became an obsession with a, a, a desire for this way of life and the attraction of it. 
that's the stirrings of grace, you know. Yeah. And um, often we can think of vocation as this kind of a big illuminative moment or, you know, but it can be very small things like the Lord can deal with us in very small ways just by giving us a desire for it. And that can be a, 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 a sign in itself. And that's what happened to me. I just I just remember being at Mass one day and I'd been going to Mass regularly at this stage for a number of months and yet was very poorly catechized as a young a young man, you know. So in, in that sense, everything was fresh and everything I was listening to and was hearing was new and, and coming alive. So first of all, it was the person of Christ. I was reading the Bible. My sister very much steeped in scripture. And uh, I was reading the Bible and the Lord was coming alive for me in the, in the pages. And so that was the foundation. And then in the Mass, um, just one particular day, I remember just the priest at the consecration and stuff and um, something just came alive that I believed, you know, really believed with living faith, you know, intellect yeah. intellectually, I, thought, I would have believed in the Eucharist and the real presence, but it just came alive to me. And I just said, if this is, if this is true, that's, that changes everything. And, and then the, 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 the figure of the priest just attracted me at that moment as well. I could do that. I want, not only can I do that, but I want to do it. Mm. Um, and so that was working on me for a number of weeks. And then one, one evening when I was praying and I was at this time, the Legion of Mary and developing a, a great devotion to Our Lady. I basically just, I, a prayer of gratitude. I give thanks to God for giving me everything I wanted. I wanted to be a soccer player as a young boy. He gave me that in abundance and a wonderful life. Yeah. And I basically said, listen, my life's over to you. What do you want me to do? Like I can go back and finish my career and become a coach. That's what I want to do. What do you want me to do? And what, what was interesting that e even that evening, um, just for this real desire for celibacy, you know, real real desire to live a celibate life, which was very profound for me. And the attractiveness, attractiveness of that, mm. I think it sometimes it appeals to, especially, I don't know, especially a masculine nature, that sense of sacrifice, you know, to lay mm. your life down for something greater than you. And uh, I saw it as something beautiful. And then I stayed about that for a few weeks and spoke to some people that I trusted. And, and it just didn't go away. And my desire for prayer was growing all the time. And and really that's it the lord starts to take over mm. in gentle ways and small ways sometimes very profound ways um and with myself i think he had to do something pretty direct because i yeah. was so far away if you know what i mean yeah. in that world and that's not the ordinary way for everyone that doesn't yeah. mean you don't have a authentic call if you haven't had this big experience yeah you know in many ways it's, it's the opposite you know maybe yeah. i had to have that experience because it was the only way the lord could get me you know yeah um so no so it was a wonderful grace i experienced it as a grace so yeah. It's the reordering of your desires, making something that's supernatural attractive uh, to you, even though we're all called to be chaste and, uh, and obedient to the Lord and, and to live simply. But this sense of kind of making those life, a, a vowed life of that way of life really attracted me. I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting, actually, that, you know, that's what that's the calling you had to get. It, it had yeah. to be that powerful because I think for other people, it could be something miraculous. It could be a healing. It could be different things. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes we kind of think, Maybe we can think that, oh, if someone experiences one of these things, it's it's nearly like a, a sign of holiness of that person. But it's no. it's not. It's it's just the love of God who's yeah. who's reaching out to everyone. And some people, it has to be more dramatic because yeah. wherever they are or whatever path they're on, mm. that's that's the call. Sure. So, yeah. And I make that point because sometimes I feel sorry for, or I don't feel sorry, but I, sometimes when we're talking about vocation, and usually when you hear testimonies, they're very extraordinary. Yeah. And I often think, you know, we've 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 men that joined the Dominican Order who have been altar servers and have always had their faith and never yeah. drifted away. Yeah. And they've never had these life sh shattering experiences. The Lord has just always been in their life and they've altar served and they found it and they liked a life of prayer and they said their rosary and then and then they joined the seminary, yeah. you know, and that's just as valid. And, and, and from my perspective, even more valid in many ways, because yeah. here they were, they were faithful. They never had to drift away like the prodigal son, like myself. But they, they, they were there and the Lord has been drawing them for years. Yeah. And in many ways, that's just as powerful. The Lord doesn't need to do extraordinary things all the time, yeah. even though the, the calling in itself, whatever form it takes, is extraordinary, you know? Yeah, yeah. because I, I think even for like, as a parent, for our children, mm. that's the life we want. Yeah. You know, whatever the, the vocation at the end of it, be it, you know, be it priesthood or be it, you know, if it's a, a religious vocation or whether it's marriage mm. or whatever, it's still that 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 life of kind of um you know that not stray from the path if mm -hmm. possible so it's kind of yeah. but it's funny it's like yeah we kind of think of a a good kind of testimony as something that's yeah. you know this kind of big saint paul moment whereas yeah. ideally we, what we want is, is we, that, want, we that, need more testimonies of just ordinary fellas who yeah. are, uh, men and women who have kind of just been faithful 
And funny, you know, you know, because you obviously having lived the the footballer lifestyle, you've played in the Premiership, so you know there was there was good money there. You've you've got the cars, the houses, the the lifestyle, and it's uh, it's funny. So you've experienced that, mm. and then you know when you listen to the folk, okay, to a testimony of someone who says, "No, I've been close to God all my life." Yeah, you know, is there a party where a guy that goes? You know, yeah. kind of thing like that. It's... Oh, there's a holy envy, you know. Yeah. In, in that sense, you know, I, that's the kind of testimonies that I love listening to. Yeah. You know, because you know, um, it's just the these people because in the culture now that's so in many ways so dominant and can draw people very easily away from gospel values and the way of the Lord and the courage it takes to stand up for your faith yeah. as a young person in universities and workplaces, you know. So for those who have just stayed the course and been faithful. That mm. fills me with more awe than, yeah. you know, my own story or, you know, somebody who needed an extraordinary grace from the Lord to yeah. to really kind of wake up in many ways, you know. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and then I suppose like that, that you know, we do say that we need more of those kind mm. of testimonies. There aren't, they are few and far between. Mm. And I suppose it kind of, it makes you think of, you know, the the narrow path and, and the wide road, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, the as Jesus says, you know, that few mm-hmm. are, you know, f- aim for the, you know, aim for the narrow door that, you know, few go that way and many go the the yeah. wide road to destruction. And, uh, and I suppose I've been on that road. You have been on that road. Um, and, and yet having been on that road, it's not a road where anything kind of feels particularly wrong at the time. Mm-hmm. it's a road I think that where there's an emptiness but you don't realise there's an emptiness yeah. you, you can't understand that emptiness until it's been filled on the sure. other side and with that emptiness I, I think that there's um there's a constant searching for distractions yeah. and this kind of you know um this you know and, and, and I found that this kind of a thing of never wanting to be alone or you know yeah. that kind of thing it was just always wanting to be Wanting to be busy and and kind of uh, and just fast paced life mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know, and uh, and so you you may not recognise it when you're on that road, but yet so many are, and I think that's kind of the topic of today's conversation of kind of yeah. you know I suppose that's that's what we were going to talk about. Will many be saved? So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> so no, I, I think what you're talking about there is um, it strikes with me as well because. Like I just finished reading Cardinal Sarah's book, you know, The Power of Silence, mm. a wonderful, wonderful book. And he, he talks about what he calls the dictatorship of noise, mm. how this uh, it's, it's the sense of man being com- uh, com- completely busy all the time in cities with their lights and their noise 24 hours a day, constantly distracting us. Yeah. And then with technology and so forth, it kind of muffles the ability to cultivate an interior life of prayer and and we're not even realized how much we're being conditioned by that. And what happens with my with myself as well, if I think back, I broke my leg playing for in my I think in my second game for Norwich and when I was twenty one and I was I was in hospital for a number of weeks and I didn't play football for a year. And it was the first time I actually stopped and I was alone a lot because I was living by myself at the time. And I remember just it was it was a period of great like reflection. I was just thinking of my life and if my football career is over, what do I do next? Yeah. But if I didn't have that moment, you know, I would have just been going from one training session to the next, one week to the next, looking forward to the weekend, looking forward to the next kind of match. And when we take a step back and even in the course of this lockdown and stuff, and when things are stripped away and you're faced with yourself and the noise is taken away or you go on retreat, you allow the deeper desires to come to the surface and the wounds Mm -hmm. come to the surface and you're faced with them. And then, you know, then that's the possibility of conversion there. You know, you're opening Mm -hmm. a path to listening um, but so many people are busying themselves all the time mm. that the the Lord is speaking to them in many different ways, but they're not. He's not breaking through. You yeah, know? yeah. And and I found even at the very start mm. of my journey into faith, I found myself getting very busy with prayer meetings and things like that. Do you know sure. what I mean? Like kind of, you know, it's like oh, there's this on. I'll go to that, and I, you know, could mm. think nothing of sitting in the car going for an hour and a half. Going oh, there's a talk on there. I'll go to that or whatever. And you can kind of think, oh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm busy and I'm doing all the right stuff. Yeah. And even at that, it's like I found that the the kind of the 
I'm by no means holding myself up as an example of holiness. But like what I'm saying is just in my journey, um, it, I kind of find that like I found that no, it, it's when when you stop mm. and and in the silence and it's you, you can't because I suppose the voice of God is so silent. It's so quiet. It speaks, you know, that yeah. we can hear it in the noise. And it's kind of just by running around. We can make ourselves busy still by just doing holy by doing what we think are holy things yeah but it may not always help us you know sure and kind of like you know kind of a little bit of a detour here but um it's interesting that one of the best books i've read in the last number of years is a book um called the noonday devil i don't know if you ever came across that no by, by a benedictine monk and um he's kind of uh reintroducing a spiritual term that kind of has been lost possibly in in christian vocabulary for a long time now but which was part of the monastic tradition called ascidia yeah you know and um and ascidia according to the the monks of the early centuries in the desert they called it the noonday devil because the monks obviously rose very early and then they were living as hermits and so they'd have their routine in the morning and then say they were getting up at six or whatever then noon would come the hottest part of the day and lethargy would kick in and they've been up so long and they're looking forward to the next meal and they feel this temptation or this sloth, you know, kick in like, yeah. I just can't, this is just too difficult, you know? Yeah. And so they call this kind of acedia. It's kind of like a, a, a spiritual laziness or a um, even a, a, sometimes a distaste for spiritual things. You're starting to lose the taste for spiritual things. But as it progressed throughout the monastic tradition, um, this this priest gives it and this book talks about acedia in religious life and priesthood but in married life as well mm. and in, in secular life and he says it's interesting because it can go to two extremes acedia can kick in say for example if someone's not praying enough they're not giving enough time to their interior life um, If so if they're not they start to lose a taste for spiritual things and seek compensations in material things and they start to yearn after those things maybe they left behind and, yeah. and seek compensations out there and they can experience this like spiritual boredom right where things used to be exciting for them spiritually like yeah. reading a book or praying a rosary now it's an effort and just can't in this yeah. kind of spiritual sloth you can't raise yourself to do it but he said on the other extreme it can it can be as well this on this restlessness where you're running around doing everything yeah. but you're in a, the inability to stay still and quiet and be in one place and just be there say in your vocation yeah. if that's marriage or religious life um, i suppose the temptation in religious life would be say um priests not spend enough time in prayer but running around everywhere doing 100 projects yes and running to people's houses and being in people's yeah. lives as compensation yeah you know and not spending enough time on their own spiritual life yeah um or that sense of laziness that lost the salt as the lord says in the yeah, gospel you know yeah. So um, I don't know how we got there, but anyway, yeah. it's it's important to talk about because I think you, you mentioned about running around there, like doing a lot of good things. Yeah. But the important thing is you can't give what you you can't give what you've not received, and so the Lord had to depart from the crowds yeah. to pray at night with His Father, and the Lord showed us the pattern of prayer. It's not an optional extra; it has to be, yeah. it has to be the, the 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 center, and it has to be abundant. Yeah. Before you do anything else, so for anyone who's listening, anybody who's doing good apostolic work measure that in kind of comparison to your prayer life yeah and if it and if it's more than your prayer life there needs yeah. to be a rebalancing there you know yeah because it, it's amazing throughout the gospels the amount of places where it does say that jesus went off to pray but mm -hmm. it's always just you know we can read it maybe as a little a throw in line at the start or the end of a story because yeah. there's something so dramatic has happened in the story but it's you know when you look for it it's like it's there it's there it's there he was constantly yeah. in prayer mm -hmm. not in kind of social justice kind of cases of and, and things like that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, taking the 12 away to teach them to pray to you yeah. know to be with him yeah you know and ultimately that's what the lord it's interesting what i can't remember which spiritual writer said but the the, the words at the beginning of the gospel the words that the lord addresses and i think it might be the beginning of john's gospel is come mm. come with me or come be with me or you know come to me mm. that's the words he addressed at the beginning and the last words he addressed he says in the gospel are go Go yeah. teach all nations. Yeah. So first we have to come to the Lord. First we have to be with him mm. before he sends us out to do anything. Mm. That has to be the first, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, that's, that's interesting. And, mm. you know, it's, I, I just think of a, a book that was 
a real big influence on me was He Leadeth Me, um, mm. you know, uh, Walter uh, Chizik, which I know is a Jesuit, so I hope that's all right if I mention <laughs> him. But, uh, but, no, the, uh, but that book had a huge impact on me because it was one of those things where I realized that in all the running around, everything that's going on, I have to stop mm. and just stop at times and kind of say, OK, what's going on here? What is the Lord doing? Yeah, because he's constantly at work. Mm-hmm. but you know I'm looking for something big and dramatic or I'm you know whatever and it's like it's little things and it, it could just be you know that little plan that I had planned just falls apart you sure. know and, and, and I kind of go okay and it, it not just oh yeah okay fine I must move with it and do it somebody else it's, a lot of time now it's like just stop and kind of say okay why what what's going on here and I'm like ah yeah maybe he's creating a window for me to do, yeah, yeah. you know, something maybe for me to pray, maybe for, mm. you know, things like that. And then at that point, that realization, that's the first part, but then the actual, that's where I have to get involved. You know, the grace is there then to pray, yeah. but I have to cooperate and go in and pray. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times I could find something on Netflix or find something like that just to yeah, distract yeah. me. And that's, yeah. you know, a wasted opportunity. But yeah, that's, that's yeah. the thing. And I think that's the thing that's so easy at times to get just distracted by the noise and all of those things and it's i think maybe at times you know when we when we look at i suppose now there's a message out there where you know like everyone's a good person if you're not Mm. if you're not hitler then you're not going to you know if you're not hitler you're not going to you know like that that's that's the bar be Mm -hmm. better than hitler and you know it's like you're on the way to heaven sure and you know and then, of course, you know, when you understand, you know, Jesus' mercy and stuff, we kind of say, it's possible Hitler's in heaven. Yeah. You know, it, possible. Um, you know, we don't know what went on at that last moment or, you know, whatever for him. And then, you know, we can hear that and kind of go, well, if Hitler's in heaven, well, then, you know, not only am I better than him, but I'm, you know, on the way. And, and oftentimes, you know, I think we go to funerals and, and we hear yeah. at funerals so often people saying, you know, um, oh, well, they're, you know, they're in a better place now. They're, you know, they're in heaven, you know, all this thing. And it's, there's so little emphasis on praying for someone's soul or, you know, it's amazing at a funeral, you'll very rarely hear a purgatory, um, you know, and and things. And it's just, it's um, just this kind of a thing that, you know, everyone is on this path. But then when we read Mm. the early church fathers, you know, and, and we read, any from Augustine through to Thomas Aquinas and mm-hmm. things, you know, plus, and well, not plus, I suppose, plus what Jesus said himself, but everything that they studied was based on what Jesus said. Yeah. And so for well over a thousand years, the church wasn't believing that mm-hmm. everyone went to heaven um, or that, you know, the majority are all going there. So simply... So what's going on now? It's like, you know, it, it's has the church changed its teaching? Mm-hmm. You know, what's the official line of the church? What What is it? And, and I suppose so. that's, that's kind of, a, you know, or, or, or yeah. where has this change come from? Um, I suppose there's a number of kind of reasons for it, not just even theologically in the church, but in society as well, you know. Um, what you get, I suppose, is the foundation before we even go into the details. Yeah. What you can say is about it, with the church, we have to understand what's called the development of doctrine. Mm-hmm. Um, where the church has a, a precise formulation of what it understands about, say, salvation and so forth. And then hard doctrine can develop. Um, I think it was Hillier, Hillier, Hillary of uh, Poitiers, or one of the church fathers, if it comes to me now, had this kind of this sense that doctrine can it, it stays the same at its essence and its core but it can i suppose reveal itself to mm-hmm. different ages mm-hmm. so you can elucidate a doctrine uh, in a particular age that maybe wasn't before but it doesn't become something new or different mm-hmm. it's just a greater deepening of what's already there mm-hmm. okay so uh, in the tradition of the church everything is founded on the words of christ obviously and there's none more so than we're talking about salvation Um, But we've had this development of doctrine uh, on this question throughout the history of the the church. And you can, individual theologians, uh, it's not so much the teaching of the church, but individual theologians can go to extremes, opposite extremes in regards to this question. Mm. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing that, you know, this, I suppose, as Ralph Martin says in the book, what we'll speak about here, this kind of, I suppose, naive 
optimism that took really took root in the 60s and 70s and 80s after the council this optimism of uh, of you know that um, fundamentally the human person is good which is a teaching of the church you mm -hmm. know absolutely yeah um but this inability to 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 realize um that salvation is an absolute free gift from christ and nothing that is owed to us and that nothing that we have merited and that it's just by our nature you know god wills all people to be saved but that doesn't automatically mean that everybody re everybody responds to that grace mm -hmm. and there's this unease in the modern psychology and modern mindset to accept the possibility that someone could be lost eternally you know so there's greater questions here about free will uh, mm -hmm. about god's will about free will of the human person uh, the teaching of the lord and the gospel and we've gone i think we've gone to an opposite extreme so in the early church there's no doubt saint augustine for example had a very pessimistic view yeah. on on the possibility of salvation um for the for the for the for the for the many he said there was, he had a doctrine of the very very few mm -hmm. um achieved with grace the salvation and saint thomas picks up saint augustine and builds on him is a little bit more open talks about the possibility of non-christians or those who haven't heard the gospel under certain conditions yeah. kind of being saved but now with the 20th century and certainly with like uh, influential theologians like Balthus Hanser, Ban Balthasar, and uh, Karl Rahner, we have this, this, these kind of movements towards um, grace being already in human nature before Christ, mm. you know, uh, and so therefore now this greater openness to uh, the question of, of 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 everyone being saved, without being explained properly of what that consists of, you know. Yeah, yeah. and and do you find that um, is it who isn't explaining it? kind of fully do you mean kind of you know well what's interesting ralph martin talks about in, in the book like the, listen what we're talking about here is yeah. ralph martin's book who her many will many be saved and he talks about um the teaching of second vatican council in lumen gentium 16 which specifically talks about salvation mm -hmm. and how and under what conditions and and who can be saved and specifically talking about say non-christians or those of different religions yeah. there was this greater o openness of the council um uh to this po this possibility that, that god's universal will to give sufficient grace to every human person to be saved which is absolutely right and true mm -hmm. um but under what conditions can we understand that these people are related to the church yeah. related to christ and saved through christ um and he divides that the very core passage on this question uh lumen gentium 16 into three sections a b and c and he breaks it up and what's amazing is the certainly in the case of Balthazar and, and, and Rahner and the majority of commentators who on their on their works they focus on 16a and 16b and which is the possibility of say Muslims Hindus Buddhists yeah. all those related not related to, uh, how are they related to church and how they can be saved by the grace of Christ but and this lends itself to this great optimism yeah which is there but it's incomplete unless as Ralph Martin says unless you 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 include that with 16c the last few sentences yeah. which which basically says but very often mm -hmm. uh, at sapius the latin word but very often many deceived by the evil one um, exchange the truth for a lie and the creator for created things mm -hmm. and ultimately fall into despair mm -hmm. and this is why the church has evangelization efforts mm -hmm. and so you know so that is that's it but very often many yeah you know so that's still very much within the tradition of the teaching of the church yeah you know that it's it's not an easy path it is a narrow path mm -hmm. and therefore but people focus on the first bits without a full kind of comprehensive look at the whole passage yeah that that's interesting because i suppose like that that it's that if we only look at a and b mm. that this thing that you know yeah well everyone these anonymous christians is, you know as, yeah. as 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 ranner termed it it's uh, if we can say oh all of these people, everyone is kind of, um, everyone is saved, you know, and, and, and whatever. It really, it takes the emphasis off the need for evangelization. Yeah. So then, um, you know, we can, at that point, if we can say that, well, everyone's saved, then, you know, you kind of, you do have to question a lot of what Jesus said, mm -hmm. if everyone is saved, because, you know, where Jesus has said, you know, about the, um, you know, the, the wicked you know everyone will be separated you know the sure. wicked will be you know it looks like jesus then was only using scare tactics yeah but 
because he's God, he still knew mm-hmm. in the end everyone will be saved, but he's just trying to scare people yeah. into doing something. And then on the other side of it, there is no consequence for our there's no consequences for our bad actions. Yeah. If everyone is saved. Mm-hmm. And you know, the Christian life is a tough life to live. Mm-hmm. It's certainly a lot easier. It's it's more fulfilling, but it's certainly a lot easier not to because I mean not even the big things initially, you know, like okay, so maybe if you're coming from a, a wild Mm-hmm. time in your 20s or something like that there might be the sexual teachings or these kind of things are, are the tough ones and but you know then there you know the maybe if it's a there might be a love of money or there might be a, a greed thing or whatever but even as we you know get down the line you know it, it's it's the things of um you know gossip and all these little things you know it's yeah it's very tough to live the, the christian life yet you know it's kind of if everyone is saved why bother sure it leads to at least to at least to relativism, which Pope Benedict was, you know, constantly critiquing in his pontificate. You know, this sense that all paths are valid towards God; they're all just different paths. Mm. You know, and that's why the 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 Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith brought out. I think it was in two thousand, um, Dominus Jesus, the document basically restipulating that Christ is a sole savior of the world, and only in and through Christ can anyone be saved, mm-hmm. even if they're of a different religion. And they've responded to God's grace through no fault of their own mm-hmm. uh, and according to their conscience and so forth. That in the final analysis, if they're saved, it's through Christ, not mm-hmm. through anyone else, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so this is the the message what we bring. But this is a this is a problem that's been in the church for since its beginning. So, for example, like you'll talk about this kind of in theological language, universalism. And it was there an origin in the early mm-hmm. centuries of the church. Yeah. And they use this Greek word a pocket of stasis or something which basically means in the end god will save all people mm-hmm. uh, and not just all people the heresy of origin and that with, with regards to that was that uh, the they, demons, they, the as, demons well. as well yeah in the end the devil and the demons will be redeemed and yeah. saved yeah. and what's interesting is you know that um it's kind of a separate topic but the creed when we say in the creed um for us men and for our salvation yeah you know, and, and sometimes modern sensibilities don't like the fact that we use men, yeah, oh, you know, yeah. instead of an inclusive term. Yeah. But the reason why that was inserted into the creed, and of course it, it, it represents the whole of humanity, male and female. But the reason why it was it was for us men and for our salvation was supposed to combat the heresy of origin that said that the angels would be saved and the devil would be saved. Ah, uh, okay. So it's for us men. Yes, human beings yeah. with intellect and will, not the not the angels. For us men and for our salvation, he descended from heaven and became incarnate, and so these things have huge theological significance, mm. and that's that universalism that all will be saved in the end, mm. um, kind of lay dormant for a lot of centuries, but it became very prevalent now in people's mindset, as you said, like funerals becoming canonization processes of people, yeah. you know, which and stuff which can lend to people not praying for people after they die and so forth yeah uh, and things like that so we've we've to, we've to strike the we've to live scripturally and 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 with the teaching of the church on these things you know and not modern sensibilities and realize that yes the christian life is the narrow path and and can be tough there's asceticism needed but as well you know st thomas Aquinas teaches that when we cooperate with grace the christian life becomes beautiful and easy yeah so the more you increase in virtue the more you it becomes there's this ease that yeah. happens yeah. so the christian life cause it, after a while after a number after you've gone through that asceticism that's needed can become joyful and there's a certain ease with it yeah. you know like in like a musician with an instrument yeah you know it becomes like second nature virtue becomes second nature yeah. and that's where we're trying to that's where the saints are yeah you know that's, yeah that's what we're trying to yeah. they do the they do the good thing by their nature without even thinking yeah. about it yeah because they're like an instrument that's docile in the hands of a yeah. musician you know uh, and that's what we're waiting. that's what we're going for. And when when certain areas, then mm. you know, you can kind of get you know get. I suppose those things become second nature. I suppose we're always then finding that other area yeah. that's that weakness in us, mm-hmm. and just trying to practice the virtue to counter that vice, yeah. and kind of, you know, and and always trying to kind of uh, get better. And but one of the things I suppose that I I don't want this kind of podcast to sound like is this thing of like two of us sitting here in this judgmental way going well Mm. we're saved 
everyone else is in trouble <laughs> you know this kind of thing and it's like and you know and and then there are you know some of the the some of the different protestant churches you know mm. will have their their own view that like well we've all been saved mm-hmm. and you know and that's it jesus died for us we're you know we're saved and and that's it whereas like the reality is that uh salvation has been won for us but we can we can yeah lose it yeah we need to appropriate it to ourselves you know yeah. and no i'm glad you made that point because you know saint paul says in his letters you know work out your salvation with fear and trembling yeah you know and you know in many ways when, sometimes when i'm talking about my vocation to priesthood and sometimes people say married couples even they look at our life and they think how beautiful it is just having this time to pray and mm. you know in many ways and think and i often remind them he says i'm not in here because i'm better in many ways, I'm in here because I'm worse, because the Lord knows that I couldn't save. My soul would be lost out there, yeah. <laughs> that I'm not strong. He knows I need the structures. I need the prayer life. I need this way of life for my salvation. And so this is what we see with the lives of the saints. The closer they come to God, they re- the greater the sinners they they, they believe they are. Yeah. You know, that's why St. Dominic, you know, if you don't mind me giving him a plug, uh, <laughs> you know, he's at our feast day tomorrow, St. Dominic. St. Dominic wept for the sins of others and for his own sins yeah. because the more the conscience becomes sensitive to spiritual things the more you start to see the little deep the deeper shadows hmm. that many of us don't see and yeah. they come to the surface and this is why the saints are so their conscience is so keen that they see themselves in the light of god's love and their and their and and this is why they do penance and this is why they, they do do these things so we're not certainly here saying that i'm working at my salvation with fear and trembling yeah with god's grace and I need that to be, I need that to be saved on a daily basis, yeah. you know. And I'm not here certainly. I'm just here. We're both of here just trying to give the teaching of the church, which is beautiful, yeah. which is challenging, and yeah. and needs to be a challenge because the Christian life is a challenge to yeah. to to each of us. But it promises something very beautiful. And then you know, I suppose there's there's this thing where we'll think that well, because it's not popular now mm. to live the Christian life um you know it's it's uh the culture around us is you know the the sexual secular culture has really taken Mm. over and it's uh it's not popular which makes it that bit harder because i suppose temptations were always there but as temptations become more popular and temptations become mainstream yeah. you know and things like that that things that were maybe once hidden are now you know kind of uh out there it's then as you start to see maybe I'm the odd one out that's kind yeah. of and everyone sees this kind of whatever this temptation is everyone sees this as normal everyone sees this as good and then we get into this thing of like well you know such and such a person they're not living the Christian life mm. but they're a good person you sure. know or that kind of thing and it's uh and then it's like well they're a good person so how could they go to hell you know and and, and this thing of hell can be seen as this doctrine from the pre-vatican II church kind of thing where it was all fire and brimstone and it was this whip to beat people to Mm. do whatever they wanted you know and it's uh, how how do you respond to that then i suppose if you the whole pre-vatican II thing you know you only have to listen to the homilies of pope francis to you know he he continually refers to the devil and the influence of the evil one and you know uh, and things like that so it's certainly not something that's been left behind it's certainly maybe in the preaching of, of people's experience in daily life in church uh, and things like that. But when we, when we talk about the, the doctrine of hell and so forth, we, and what you're talking about, there are people who are good. We always have to make a distinction between natural goodness and supernatural grace mm-hmm. and supernatural life. The Christian is called not just to be good. We're called to be saints and we're called not to mediocrity, but to life within, life within the Trinity, life, the life of grace, the fullness of life. And so, of course, there's natural goodness in human beings. God created us this way. Even after the fall, we retain that natural, natural goodness or a tendency to what, towards what is good. We want to love. We want to know the truth. We want to live these things. That's natural to our, to our human nature. But that is not enough. That is why Christ came. <laughs> you know, yeah. if that was enough, then why the Lord would not have needed to came not would not have came in this particular way to save us. Yeah. God could have saved us in a majority of a multitude of ways, but He chose through Christ through the cross um, to redeem us. And so that if we didn't need that, if we were natu- if natural goodness was enough, that just being a good person and doing the basic minimum, um, then the Lord would not have needed to come. 
-hmm. And what he had to offer was much more. And so that's what we're saying. We're saying, yes, if you have a basic temperament that's naturally good in many different ways, you're kind, patient and so forth, you have natural virtue. But when you're living a life of grace with the Lord, he, he adds to that virtue and he uh, raises it up hmm. to live on a supernatural level. This is the life of, of Mother Teresa. It's Mother Ter- that's, that's not natural charity. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's not natural charity of just helping the poor out on the weekend or giving... So- it's not narrow to lay your life down and go out on the streets of Calcutta every single day. That's not natural human effort. That's supernatural grace moving her to do heroic things. Yeah. And this is what the saints teach us, you know. So I think it's the Lord calling us to to a, a greater a greater sense of, of the fullness of, of a human being, not just to be content where you are. Yeah. You know, and this is what we're saying. And the doctrine in hell really flows from that. It flows from the love of God, surprisingly. Yeah. You know, if God truly loves us, then he creates us free. And with that freedom, he gives us the opportunity to accept him or to, or to reject him. Yeah. And the same as in marriage or in love, you cannot coerce another person to love you. That's not love. It has to be reciprocal. Mm. And in that way, God will never force himself upon us. And so therefore, in his mercy, if someone has continually throughout life, and what the, I'm sorry, the important point to make here is God gives every single person what's called sufficient grace for salvation, every person Mm. that he's created. He's constantly trying to break through in many different ways to draw them to himself. And throughout a lifetime, if a person has consciously and willfully and deliberately chosen to reject that grace and reject God's advances all the time and to the extreme of of, uh, moral evil and shaping their characters and their souls in such a way, that at the point of death, what happens is just a continuation of the choices that we made in life. Mm. That we've chosen to live a life separate from God. We didn't want him in our life. We didn't want... And at, at, at the moment of death, God respects that freedom. Mm. And he allows an existence. Somehow this is a mystery. We don't know what it's like. We can give images and so forth. An existence that is separated from him in a sense of not because nothing can exist apart from him. But from his grace and the joy of being in union with him in heaven. Mm-hmm. And so it's an act of mercy to the, yeah. and not impinging on someone's free will. Yeah. Not God to cl- actually sending someone there, um, taking pleasure in, in doing this, hmm. but respecting the freedom of an individual. Yeah. And, and you know, that's interesting. I was reading yesterday um, Fulton Sheen's uh, book, I think, Life is Worth Living. Mm. And, you know, he, he um, tackled the question of um, if... God knows everything and he's outside of time. God knows what my actions are because obviously, you know, I would, I pray that I'd be saved. I, you know, try and cooperate with the grace every day. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what, if some great tragedy hit my life, Mm -hmm. I I hope to God that I will, you know, stay close to God Mm -hmm. through the whole thing. But, Anything could happen. I mean, you know, like I could turn away from God. Any any chain of events could happen, you know, because I suppose like that, that, you know, the devil's prowling around like a, a roaring lion, you know, that it's it's not that the devil longs for us to be with him. It's that the devil longs to keep us away from God. Of course. Yeah. And so um, and so like that, I don't know what, what term, but God knows in the end whether I'll be saved or not, because he's mm-hmm. outside of time. Same with yourself, same with, same with everyone. And so God knows the people who will reject him. And then the question comes, why would he create someone sure. that, you know, that would reject him? Mm-hmm. And and Fultachin kind of said that, you know, because it was like this, is it predestination that, yeah. that God, you know, and Fultachin kind of said that's like, well, it's like this, if, if a if somebody knows that a stock um in the stock market if a stockbroker knows that this stock is going to go up 10 points in the next six months and he decides to invest in the stock or whatever and it goes up six points in the next six months he has not caused it to go up uh he has not predestined it to go up Mm -hmm. he knew it will go up and it went up by itself and in the same way when we can use that imagery mm. in the same way when someone rejects God and, and separates themselves, well, 
they are the ones who who chose yeah. not to yeah absolutely like you know a lot of the theologians kind of when it comes to because it is a mysterious question and pastorally mm. it's very difficult sometimes when someone hits you with that you know like you know well why would he create me in the first place if i was if he knows that i was going to reject him and so forth yeah and you know a lot of the the theologians ultimately say you know you know they use a philosophical term it's it's better to be than not to be yeah in the sense of like if you know god's inner life which is love and goodness and the nature of goodness is to diffuse itself and create and overflow into beauty and it's god's very nature to overflow into creation and to create us um so it's better to exist than to never have existed at all mm-hmm. the fact that we that some somebody if they've rejected him and so forth it, it, from god's perspective it was better to create in the first place because it's something beautiful the human being and so forth uh, and and so and, and so absolutely that's that's what you can, that's what you can say but that being said there is a doctrine there is in catholicism a doctrine of predestination yeah. okay it's not calvinist or uh, the calvin calvinist uh John Calvin had this doctrine of kind of sort of pre double predestination where God predestines someone to oh, hell. Yeah, you know before you know before creating anything. them. Yeah, exactly. oh, yeah. which yeah. is kind of anathema to Catholic thinking, yeah. Yeah. you know, and to how we understand God. Um, but in the theology of grace, there is this notion of pre. Some God gives grace to every single person, uh, and what that means is He gives gives us the grace to act. So he gives someone a particular grace to act a certain way that keeps them on the path towards him. But some people he gives not only the grace to act, but he actually moves them as well. Okay. Interiorly uh, through grace, moves them with their freedom intact, mm-hmm. moving them towards accomplishing that, that act. Okay. And that's something added. That's something different. Right. That's what they call like efficient grace. So that's like, and he says sometimes for his purposes, because gift yeah. grace is a free gift. God can give it or he doesn't need to give it. It's yeah. up to him. It's free. It's yeah. his gift to give it to us. We don't, we're not owed it. Um, but for his purposes and for his plan of salvation, sometimes, say for a particular person who would have a particular role, yeah. he could give not only the grace to act, but he could actually move them as well to fulfill his purposes. And In a way, we could nearly see like St. Paul, you know, that kind of, that that big moment, kind of that, that huge yeah. thing that it's possible that mm. that's why he got that extra thing. There was a... A bigger yeah. calling, a, a purpose mm-hmm. for a, a specific bigger purpose there for him. He needed that extra, yeah, big shake up and push. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. God, and that's that's a that's a Catholic understanding of predestination. Yeah, the predestination of the saints that God ju- doesn't only give them, offer them the grace to act or a, p- a power to act, mm-hmm. but He actually brings the act about by moving them mm-hmm. interiorly towards the to accomplishing the act. Yeah, and that's he's completely free to do that it's his yeah. free gift we're not we're, we're not deserving of it and he can withhold and he can give with you know this yeah. is the thing and that's not to say that everyone else doesn't have like you've said already yeah. that everybody else has that mm-hmm. grace to be saved yeah it's just whether they want to reject it or or not yeah. but again like this this you know the the thing of this um you know so you, you you've touched on well you, you've gone into why Mm. not all good people will will be kind of um say because there's the the types of goodness but you know this this thing of the the narrow path and and, yeah. and the way that this inversion of it do you know yeah. this kind of a thing it's so okay we know augustine was very strict mm-hmm. and you know so we get to aquinas he he's after speaking about the those who are outside the church not of their own choosing. Mm-hmm. They haven't heard the gospel yet. Um, so where from there, because that still doesn't seem to sound like where we are now. Yeah. You know, so yeah. where did we go from? So that's in the, the 1200s, that mm-hmm. kind of way. And that teaching will continue on for a few hundred years. Mm-hmm. Where does it explode? We'll say. I suppose it, ex- it's, it's, it starts to explode in the, in the 20th century yeah you know um, because Aqui- the teaching of Augustine through Aquinas really lasts right up through the Middle Ages through the Council of Trent right up to yeah. the, maybe the, the early part of the 20th century yeah. and then you have you have to take a factor into as well kind of you know the culture and society at the time the two world wars all these different elements um, but as we were talking about before if you look at the writings of, of certainly Rahner and, and, and Balthazar as well 
and this will resonate with so many of us and resonates with like a lot of parents mm. and grandparents who are like worried for their 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 children who have abandoned the faith and so forth so Carl Ranner uh, in his in his in his writings is looking around and you know he's seen society become less Christian the kind of you know all the structures Christendom being kind of deconstructed in many ways the secular state and so forth and he's seen all these people who were professed fully incorporated members in the church all of a sudden leaving the church and leaving and abandoning their faith and in many ways and and not always abandoning their faith but just kind of a, a laxity taking place there and he's distressed you know and with his theological training that's proceeding coming from the centuries he's thinking how can i in his distress how can i understand that these people are will not be saved these people will be damned in a sense you know you can understand and that you can understand that because even, i mean i would yeah. love it if everyone is saved yeah. sure you'd love it if of everyone course. is saved and so out of his pastoral sensitivity yeah. he's kind of looking around and and both answers van balthazar as well and thinking trying to formulate theological theories mm. within the tradition of the church um and again an expanding of that tradition or kind of a elucidation of what the church already teaches to, to with a more optimistic view of salvation focusing on Christ's universal will to save all people um, and it takes him in a direction to talk about the anonymous Christian the anonymous Christian just basically at his fundamental level he basically would, would say that at creation, at conception a human person is naturally open to the transcendent towards God mm. through, their, through, the, through creation but not only that he, he talks about what's called he gives it this term a supernatural existential which basically means they're not only open to God, but the grace is already implanted in their nature. Okay. Mm. And when they hear the gospel or our conversion happens, it's just a fulfillment of what's already there. Okay. In their nature. So it's grace first. Yeah. And then, yeah. So they, yeah. they've received this kind of supernatural existential, this openness to God, this uh, grace that's kind of at a, I suppose, embryonic form there. And as they go through life and they hear the gospel message and if they turn towards God, it's the fulfillment of something that's already there in their nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so therefore, you know, if that's already there in the nature, then all of a sudden you can see, well, outside the church, different religions, if supernatural grace is already in the nature and they haven't heard the gospel yet, you know, they're yeah. still they're open trying, to God. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. so there's this optimism that takes place in his writings. Now, I would have problems with that in, in many ways, of yeah. kind of coming from St. Thomas in the sense of St. Thomas always distinguishes between nature and grace okay. and that grace is not owed to the human being. The problem that I have there with Ranner's teaching is that if grace is, if that supernatural grace is already implanted in human nature, yeah. that it kind of can give the impression that God is obliged to bring that about because if he puts something in nature, why would he then frustrate that nature? Yeah. You know, yeah. then then some, somehow it's it's owed to us yes. to fulfill that. Yeah. Instead of Christ coming as something absolutely new and added to us and given to us completely freely without it being owed to us. Mm. You know, so fundamentally it's just this, we've gone to the extreme of this huge optimism mm. that's, not, that's not rooted in the, the teaching of Christ. And it seems, to, yeah. like you said earlier, yeah. it seems to think Jesus's uh, teachings on possibility of losing one's salvation are just warnings or threats. Yeah. You know, when that's not the teaching of, of Christ in the Gospels, it's not the teaching of how the church understood that after. Yeah, because, th well, that's it, because, you know, it, it's, there's also then a kind of, a, perhaps a, a bit of a concern for, you know, sometimes we can get a little bit, maybe lazy inside mm. the, the church we can kind of think if i just do my bit but i think isn't it lumen gentium i think it's 14 mm -hmm. that speaks about the um as catholics we have a higher calling yeah that we have you know that so more like the more we know mm -hmm. um and it's not to say like well you'd be better off to know <laughs> little because <laughs> sure, it's sure. like because there's there's a standard for what you know anyway. So, you know, if... But then everyone has a conscience as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and conscience is given by God and, and we can dull our conscience by living a life of sin. So so sometimes maybe we can kind of have this little idea that, uh, well, if, if I don't share the gospel with my friends, then they can't reject the gospel and things sure, like this. Sure. 
these are people who are born and raised Catholic. Mm-hmm. The first time they've sinned, they've had that guilt and just kind of, you know, it's it's, it's dulled their conscience. Um, the duty is there to share the gospel yeah. with everyone to to help everyone mm-hmm. to, you know. To, so with that kind of higher duty and higher calling there, it's it's nobody's off the hook and just going to mass on a Sunday and maybe saying my prayers some nights or some mornings when I feel like it and just going in, sitting through mass, you know, maybe reading the leaflet or, you know, whatever kind of thing. Sure, or sure. Even, even if I fully partake in mass and just walk out the door, mm-hmm. but I'm not doing everything else that's it, I could be in trouble. Yeah, and but what I the caveat I would put there, you know, yeah. <laughs> is in the sense of like the responsibility is not only on the people who are coming, mm. but on priests as well. I would yeah. lay the yeah. kind of uh, the responsibility there on priests and stuff uh, for us to to teach and to preach about the faith in such a way that informs people and, and, and makes coming to the mass that they fully understand what has actually taken place, mm-hmm. that they're fully catechized and they're fully understand the beauty of what they're actually coming to to bring it alive mm. and to help them enter into it much more so someone coming to mass who's going through the motions like that could be for a number of reasons they've just never had it they've never been taught the beauty of what's actually taking place in the mass or they've mm. just kind of drifted along or there could be through, through their own neglect you know that's obviously kind of mm. right as well so you know but you're right in the sense of lumen gentium talk, in chapter and 14 talks about um the calling of catholics who have been given the grace of full membership of the body of Christ, um, the responsibility that comes along with that, because it makes the distinction between living faith and dead faith. Mm. So through baptism, we have living faith, where we, we receive the dwelling of the Holy Trinity in our souls, and we're fully incorporated into the church. But through sin or through neglect, faith is still not lost. We can still believe, but it's not animated by charity. And therefore, we've dead faith. Living faith is faith animated by charity, which leads us to live a life of grace. If if we're in conscious mortal sin continually over a longer period of time, we may still believe God exists. We may still intellectually believe the faith, mm. but yet the life of the soul is not in a state of grace. And therefore, mere membership of the church is not enough. Mm-hmm. In many ways, you're in a more dangerous predicament mm-hmm. because you've had the fullness of truth revealed to you. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and, so, and so that's the key, which is important. To, I'm glad you brought that up. Because here we're not saying as Catholics, you know, because yeah. this was the temptation of the old of the Pharisees who thought just by belonging to the Jewish religion yeah. and the Jewish nation was enough for salvation. Mm-hmm. And this is what Christ critiqued them on, you know. Yeah. It's not just belonging to the chosen people. It's actually believing in me, living a life, living the law through grace, through me. Yeah. You won't be saved just by belonging to the people, yeah. you know. And so it's a good point. And the commission then as well to go and preach the, you know, preach the gospel to all nations. That commission was not just for missionary priests or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. That's that's for everyone. Now, it's not to say that, like, you know, don't go to work on Monday and go <laughs> stand on street sure, corners sure. shouting at everyone that, you know, <laughs> not everyone will be saved. But it's, you know, yeah. it's it's in in... To the example mm-hmm. of how we live. Um, and the better way to do that then is, is to catechize ourselves. Yeah. And and um, and to, to form ourselves. And and just through reading the the gospels and, and learning learning about Christ and learning the, the life of Christ and, and things like that, that we can become better examples. But yeah. also to speak at the right time as well. Mm. Because there can be a fear, you know, that oh, if I, you know, I'd be one of those Bible bashers if I mentioned Jesus to my friends. These are the guys that, you know, maybe it's like, oh, these are the guys that I used to always go drinking with all the time and, and stuff yeah. like that. And then it's, you know, I've changed my life. I kind of want to have a foot in both camps. I don't want to <laughs> tell them, you know. Yeah. And it's kind of like, oh, it's easier to just say nothing. You know, kind of thing. And, and, yeah. and if I say nothing, it doesn't raise the standard for them. Or, you know, if, sure. if I don't say it, they don't have to reject it or so on. But that's a neglect on my part then. Yeah. Without, com- without banging on their door. Yeah, like. it, com- yeah. it comes down to the fact that, you know, um, that as Christians, we were not called to, um, I suppose, just to, to mix in, but to stand out. Mm. You know, we're called to stand out in many ways and, and to be a light. You're the light of the world. 
and so listen i know it's difficult for people to navigate their way through life in relationships and especially as a minority and a small kind of remnant or in the midst of all of this but at the same time you know there's a number of ways to discern and be prudent about that and and, and not to kind of compromise your conscience so um again st thomas aquinas of beautiful wisdom about this sometimes says that if you're in a, if you're if you're in a situation where your people are um talking about god or say talking about the church and so forth or cracking jokes about this and that or that's not appropriate accord and is mm. kind of hurting your faith um he says sometimes even by your your silence can be enough the fact that you're not engaging the fact that you're you show displeasure on your face or you show dis- that you're displeased with this conversation can prick the consciences of other people mm. so by your silence you're showing um, I'm not not talking about a cowardly silence, but a, a silence that I'm not engaging in. This I don't find this funny. This is not appropriate for me. Well, even without words, they can sense your your unease about it, mm. and that can be a witness. But at the same time, the church does teach that there are a number of occasions when you're absolutely obliged to speak out, mm-hmm. and those uh, uh, just to say a few, a number two of those specifically is when God's honor is at stake. So if God is being blasphemed, or or uh, in many ways you're obliged to speak. Okay, you know. And you're obliged to speak also that if because of your silence, somebody else would be scandalized. So, for example, you're in a company with another Catholic yeah. whose kind of faith is a little bit weaker than yours. OK. And you're more confident in your faith. And this is happening. And you're in a, in a moment of lack of courage. You're, you're silent. And your friend who's a little bit weaker faith, their faith is damaged because you were quiet. Ah, okay. You know that you're obliged to kind of to speak out in that situation again. Listen, it's difficult. I know we yeah. all know it's difficult. Yeah. But we're called. This is the this is what discipleship means. This is yeah. what the cross means. This is why the Lord warned us in the gospel. Yeah. If you follow me, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah. But we always have to keep what's promised us. The, the glory that's promised us is mm. can't the mind can and the eye cannot even see or uh, perceive. You know, as Saint Paul tells us. You know, and we have to keep that in mind. The, the reward is such. And you know, a lot of the time we can focus very much on you know on heaven mm. on you know on on everyone's soul as as you know the this need for evangelization kind of as well but there's also like nobody mm. will be happier without god in their life than they yeah. will be with god in their life of course and so like just simply to bring happiness to someone is just to kind of it's it's kind of it's a bit selfish to come yeah. along and, and if someone is living away from it, it's, it's a bit selfish to kind of say, well, actually, I know what would make you happier, but I'm not telling you yeah. kind of thing, because I'd be afraid that you'd think I'm an idiot or, you know, that I'm a, a holy Joe or, you know, whatever the fear would be. You know, it's it is a bit selfish as well. Yeah. And so it's it's not an act of charity. Yeah. To, and to, it's, to, it's, to keep it, it doesn't belong to us to keep it, keep it to ourselves. Yeah. It's given to us as free gift. It's, it's not within our power to withhold that from someone else you know God has mm-hmm. used us God has used us as instruments God in the beauty of his creation has created us as intelligent beings and he wants us to cooperate in his plan of saving the whole world and bringing fulfillment and bringing life in abundance mm-hmm. and so we ha- he can do it all himself of course he can he can hit mm-hmm. someone with a moment of grace yeah. but he wants to include us in this whole symphony of creation and, and using us as his instruments to do that you know and, and, and we don't have a right to withhold that from someone yeah. Which person would not? Which person wouldn't welcome the idea if it's formulated properly, of a God from all eternity, that your existence was willed, and God created you for a purpose, and your life has meaning and purpose, your suffering has meaning and purpose, that He walks with you in the midst of that, and when this life is over, that what He promises you is beyond what your mind can imagine. What message? That's the good news of the gospel. Mm. Who would not welcome that message? So again, a lot of it's down to how we propose it and formulate it and teach it. Yeah. You know, in the manner in which, because as you said in the book, he does, he does say this that the missionary activity of the church is hampered mm. if the witness of the preachers and the teachers, or those Christians, communicating the faith is not, their lives don't correspond to what they're teaching, mm-hmm. then we can't blame those who, uh, who don't receive it. Yeah. If they're scandalized by the the message is not it's not just a, it's not just a, a um, that we tell the message. Oh, now they've heard it. They should. They know. Yeah. No, your life, they have to see the life, the correspondence with the life and what you're teaching to make the, the gospel really take root sometimes. So that's the yeah. onus on us. Because I think sometimes as well, we can see on, on social media and things like that, mm-hmm. on, on Facebook and stuff that, you know, sometimes there might be a, maybe a newspaper article 
that you know it'll take a pop at the church and you know like that that and sometimes you know there can be this thing of some people may kind of um some people may say they might comment and defend the church and then they'll get ridiculed and others will see that i've been in the situation where i've seen that at times and kind of thought i'm not jumping into that fight (laughs) you know kind of thing yeah but i'm but it's a friend of mine on Facebook mm-hmm. that's getting slated for you know for defending the faith or something and in that situation you know it's it can be a case where all of this kind of um all this negativity mm-hmm. can be scandalizing others and 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 changing yeah. the opinion so you know I suppose it's like we can be very quick to type messages to different things but mm-hmm. it's it, it's good to just and with in a loving way to just defend the church, defend yeah. the faith, and that's that's our duty in yeah. that situation. And we have to hold on to the fact that the, the the truth, the truth will set you free, and the truth is love. Yeah. So speaking the truth, okay, in the manner of how you deliver that, you know, is is, is what we need to deliver it in such a way as that that you're attracting people and not repulse, making them repulse. But um, the truth is love in itself. Mm. You know, so the most charitable thing you can do to someone is is tell them the truth yeah you know yeah. and i and i mean and i mean that and that's that was an absolute gift to me in my life that i had a family members and friends who told me in no uncertain terms you know that i wasn't living right you know and, and did it in such a way that you know okay, okay and very straight sometimes but it was eventually i came to realize it because they loved me you know and how, yeah. how many how many years before you kind of listened to them about five years, you know. Right. Yeah. And, so. and in that five years, as you're being told, you're not living right. Mm. And at that point, you're early mid twenties, is it? Mid twenties. Yeah. So you're mid twenties. Mm. <laughs> right. I'm just getting my head around this. You're mid twenties. You're a Premier League footballer. You're probably driving some ridiculous car, living in whatever kind of a house, earning whatever kind of thing. And someone is saying you're not living right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it must be, you must be kind of you know um, looking in a very material way yeah. and thinking, yeah, says the person at home who's you know <laughs> kind of whatever you know, and it's uh, you know someone struggling to pay bills or whatever kind of a situation someone's in you know, mm. but even then, deep down, is there something kind of gnawing at you now i would have to say in all honesty no no at that okay stage. yeah um and i often say this because people there can be a certain amount of nat- natural happiness that can yeah. keep someone going for a long time yeah so again you've to distinguish between natural happiness and supernatural happiness people can find natural happiness in goods and wealth and things and yeah. relationships and so forth and that can keep them sustained for a period of time but ultimately I suppose I think I, I believe in, that the life of the soul will make itself felt and the poverty of the soul will make itself felt. Right. And for me, people have that different time in their lives for some reason. You know, this mm. is the mystery of God, you know, and how he interacts with people. Uh, for me, that happened in my late 20s when I'd exhausted the way of life that I had and it exhausted mm-hmm. everything it had to offer. Someone can be happening later in life, you know, kind of towards the end of their life, this realization, what is, what's that all been worth? You know, and the, the spiritual life might become the reality of death or might confront them with that. Maybe mm-hmm. the, the change. We don't know. But but yeah, I was happy. I was naturally happy. And I suppose it happened to you in your late 20s. But a footballer's life, a footballer's career, you know, the you're very lucky to be at the peak in your kind of early to mid 30s. So it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, it's. That that time is probably the time where you're seeing people who are maybe a couple of years ahead of you are yeah, retiring, starting and, retire, yeah. start, and you're starting to realize, well, what mm. my next contract might be the last big one or whatever kind of you know whatever way it'll be, and mm. and you're uh, so you've probably got sight of the future. Sure, at that age, that most people won't have yeah in their that's a good point, yeah. in their kind of late 20s i mean if you were if you'd been a professional golfer mm-hmm. it might be well into your 40s before you're course. actually looking you know in that way and so i suppose kind of for family members of mm-hmm. you know or, or parents who are maybe thinking 
I have to speak to my children and I have to whatever, you know, don't also have a time frame of like, well, if I say to them at 23 for five years, at 28, it's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, you know, because, time. you know, yeah. I suppose it's like, uh, you know, uh, there can be a time where life, the material life is just on mm-hmm. the up. Yeah. Before it'll, it'll kind of get exhausted. Yeah. Like, like you said. So, yeah, so yeah. we've seen, it's not, we're not saying anything new in the sense of the par, the prodigal son, you know? Yeah. It's there, the Lord knows this, the Lord knows that, that the son goes off and squanders and takes his inheritance and squanders and exhausts that way of life yeah. until he real, comes to his senses. Yeah. You know, and realises that, you know, that I can go back to my father's house and, and be a hired hand, whatever, you know, and the father clothes him in a robe of glory. And, you know, we, we see that story and it's lived out in many people's lives, you know? And so sometimes a lot of people divert from the path and the Lord is trying to bring them back and family members and friends could be instrumental in that process. And there's an urgency to it. We shouldn't wait. There's an urgency mm. to it. Always to be uh, provoking and in, in a good way and prompting people with deeper questions, you know. Mm. Um, what, what would you do if, okay, your life's great at the minute. You have all this money and this kind of notoriety and kind of people respect you and honour from your job and things like that. What would you do if that was all taken away tomorrow? Mm. You know, what's your character? You know, we have to form people in virtue like what's the most important thing is your soul and your character not what you do because those things can be taken away mm-hmm. you know it's and what you're left with is yourself yeah. and 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 that's what we're trying to pre- it's not that the Christ- christian message is everyone has to sell everything they own mm. and you can't live in the world and be materially well off and yeah. that's not the message the message is detachment yeah if you have things you use them well and they're they can be great gifts from god and you can use them in abundance in your gifts and your talents and material wealth and you know it's about not being dominated by these things but using them well and being detached in a, in a christian sense you know and, and and that's the key so our message is not just our message is for people with all different backgrounds hmm. you know this will elevate your life to another level mm-hmm. not take away from it hmm. you know? so so like that when we're kind of you know maybe talking to friends it's not this kind of starting a story by kind of going like hmm. do you know that like so many people will go to hell. It's kind of, you know, it, it can be just this gentle thing of simply like, what do you think the meaning of life is? In in this kind of a, you know, in in a when you, if you have that time over mm. a pint or whatever, it's kind of not that you'll always shout that out in a nightclub. But you know, it's yeah. it's kind of. But when you're having that kind of chat, it's kind of like, what do you think it's all about? What do you, and 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 getting those kind of things can strike up mm-hmm. those conversations because I think. With this thing of the, the 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 notion that's kind of there, you know, I suppose from Van Balthazar and Ranner that, you know, all will be saved or everyone will be saved. I've seen this kind of thing before, you know, that, well, see, obviously we know that, um, and we know that the church hasn't, you know, anyone who's declared a saint, we know they're in heaven. Mm-hmm. So, fine. But they've never declared anyone's in hell. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, and that's good. But, um, but we see from the message of Fatima that, you know, there, uh, which the church has approved, that there are many souls in it. Uh, the Our Lady has said it. Jesus in the Divine Mercy with St. Faustina has again said that many souls go to hell. Um, and again, church approved. So so the church is approving messages that, you know, yeah. many, many are, are going to hell. But I suppose... Judas is one that comes up at times in a kind of a thing of a kind of a topic of debate at times, you know, and it's like, yeah, the church has not proclaimed that Judas is in, in hell or anything. But when Jesus said mm-hmm. it'd be better for that man if he'd never been born. Mm-hmm. Well, if Jesus w- or if Judas was to spend from now until the end of the world yeah. in purgatory. And then makes mm-hmm. it to heaven. It would kind of make Jesus's words, you know, you could probably look at Jesus in heaven that day and kind of go, why would it have been better that he was never born? <laughs> sure. You know, yeah. so so from that kind of thing, again, it doesn't make sense to put out this thing that like, you know, all will be saved, you know, mm-hmm. from just even those little things that Jesus has yeah. said. You know. what, what I would what I would like to say because obviously this in the sense of like from Rahner's teaching and from from Balthazar's teaching hmm. is they're well within the tradition of the church okay and they're very careful with their language not mm-hmm. to go beyond the official teaching of but in their theological speculation what you can say is they've 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 gone beyond in many ways um 
they've stretched it to a certain extent that's departed from the scriptural witness in many ways you know mm -hmm. Ranner makes that point there's tremendous obstacles to overcome here in scripture mm -hmm. you know Bal von Balthasar he says that we we dare to hope yeah okay so he's very careful not to say that everyone's Every, a, okay everyone's saved yeah he says but as Christians he says we have an obligation to hope that everyone will be saved and I think that's that's correct that, that hope should be there in every person we shouldn't want yeah. someone to be lost yeah okay so that hope is there what we have to ask as, as Christians, as, a court, as Catholics, according to the scriptures, according to the teaching of the church, the witness of Christ uh, and the need for evangelization, the urgency for evangelization, what's the probability that all are saved? And it doesn't look, you know, in the case that the majority of people will be saved. Yeah. You know, when we see the, when we see the power of free will and we see the power of a world that's anti-Christ and anti-gospel, you know, that, that can draw people away from God, you know. And yeah. so that gives us an urgency. Mm -hmm. that we have to bring this message to people mm -hmm. you know but i just wanted to make that point is the yeah. balthazar is talking about that we should have, have this hope hope hope, hope that in the okay. end all, that god's will will be will, will prevail mm. but yet that hope has to be rooted in what we know from christ yeah that we're not making this stuff up ourselves that is rooted in the tradition of the church yeah which is coming from the gospels yeah okay okay no no that's that that's yeah. good and and then i suppose from from there like that that well, hope is a good thing, and 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 yeah. then we can hope that you know. I mean, we we can hope that for each individual person, mm -hmm. you know, we we can hope, but we also know that that salvation is nothing I can do my myself. I can only cooperate with grace from from God. So it's yeah. it's like I can't save myself. Only yeah, yeah. That because that can be a kind of a misconception. Also, that this kind of a thing that well. If I do this and I do this and I do this, but mm. it's not. It's 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 this cooperation with grace. Yeah, it's easy. It it kind of treats God as a transaction. Mm. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah. in the sense of like, I do this, then you're obliged to respond to me. Yeah. So I do this particular work. God gives me grace. Yeah. I do the. That's not the the Christian life is not. It's the Christian life is about friendship with Christ, mm. and friendship. You know, that is it is about union with Jesus in that sense. So it's it's never my effort then God's grace. Yeah. My effort is the result of God's grace. Yes. And this is very much, you know, these, this was huge controversy in the church itself from the Jesuits and the Dominicans and, yeah. and uh, Jansenism and things like th these heresies that maybe overstressed human effort, mm -hmm. unaided by God's grace that I can, you know, it's a white knuckle ride and I can achieve my salvation, you know, mm. uh, and things like this. But one of the things I'm kind of really grateful for our theological formation at St. Thomas is that God's grace is always operative. Mm. you know it's not that i do something and god gives me grace mm. if i'm moving if i'm doing something that's virtuous and good it's already the operation of god's grace working in me grace and yet i'm still free you yeah, know yeah, yeah. um and and so god is at work it's all it's all it's holy god and holy me at the same yeah. time 100 yeah. percent me and 100 percent god yeah. that's a mystery we don't understand how that happens actually that's you know? that's interesting because I, I i was reading a little debate about um uh it's a case and it was you know it was so it's the case climbed the tree mm. so it was like well he climbed the tree of his own accord and then jesus came and it was like so was it who acted first it's the case and then jesus came and called him or whatever but then oh, the the kind of the clincher at the end of the debate was well no jesus came to the town yeah first mm -hmm. which prompted the case to climb the tree so <laughs> grace came first Sure. And then he reacted to that by climbing the tree and yeah, so yeah. on. So, so grace is always, yeah, yeah. Grace, yeah, grace is always, is always like operative. Yeah. And, and, you, and again, you have to, you have to be very, again, I talk, when I talk to people about this, you have to be very careful how you understand grace. Yeah. Because sometimes I think many of us have this understanding of grace is that some kind of property, like I'm drinking water here, you know, it's a material thing. Yeah. But, okay, so grace is something that God gives me like a, you know, yeah. You know, I make a crude image, but like you know, Popeye having spirit, spinach. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the spiritual kind of, uh, I don't know, a power a, like, yeah, yeah, spiritual. It is a spiritual power, but I mean, but but spiritual like a, Lucas Aid kind of thing, like yeah, yeah. I yeah. suppose like an athlete's a performing enhancing drug or something yeah. you know, that enhances your performance or something. You know, it's not a property. It's not a thing. It's friendship with. Christ. It's the divine life throwing flowing through you. Yeah. It's participation in God's life. And because you're inserted into the life of God through grace, his power is flowing through you and working through you. Mm. Uh, now, he, do, he, does, he can give someone a particular grace for a particular act. Yeah. 
Mm. So someone prays the night before doing an exam, yeah. God give me the light to study those things that I'm going to encounter in my exam tomorrow. Yeah. God can, can give a, an actual grace mm-hmm. to somebody for a very particular thing, yeah. uh, a power that elevates their intellect and their will. Yeah. But sanctifying grace, that grace that makes you holy, is, is, is communication of God's very life continually yeah. into your soul. Yeah. You know, and that's something very different than like, oh, I, I'm getting something that yeah. it makes me able to do this thing. And that, that communication is always there from God then. So it's it's that that sanctifying grace is always there. We're mm-hmm. the ones who decide, no, I'd, I'd rather do this. Yeah. Then so so this is what the church teaches. This is what, you know, this is what Jesus says someone is not to do. This is what the Bible says, you know, and, and it's because often, you know, we can hear this. Will the church modernize their teachings? And Father Damien Valley spoke about why they can't but it's like you know we read the the bible and it's you know it's fornicators adulterers drunkards you know um you know homosexual yeah and it's all of this kind of it's uh it's saying that this can enter the the king of heaven because by choosing to do these things and i think often in that line you know, we can look at the big ones Mm -hmm. and kind of go, oh, but like, you know, the things like drunkards and these kind of things, you know, are mentioned in there. And I think they're things that we overlook quite often because it's hidden in alongside all these other things, you know, and, and, but, but all of these things that, um, they're where we know they're wrong. And then we choose, nah, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it anyway. So it's like that that sanctifying grace is is the thing that's that's showing us these things are the things that are they're wrong. You know this. God is like, no, I'm 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 helping you, I'm I'm communicating that to you. Yeah. And we're kind of going, Yeah, mm-hmm. but I'd still rather go and get drunk. Or I'd rather you know, yeah. and it's kind of thing. And so we're the ones who are kind of freely choosing then to go, mm. no, nah, we're we're kind of we're cutting that. And and I suppose yeah. from there then that's where we kind of won't leave with with all bad news that's where confession comes into yeah it, and that is the incredibly good news yeah 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 i suppose like the goal of the goal of the christian life is really can be boiled down to is to be schooled in virtue to grow in virtue yeah you know the goal of, is the goal of the christian life is to to be like god yeah. you know and and virtue does that so when we talk about drink and all these different yeah. things you know you know it's a, 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 a important to kind of say you know that you know, it's in, in this book of wisdom in the psalm, you know, wine was given to cheer a man's heart. Yeah. You know, that the goal for all of us is is to be virtuous with these things, to enjoy them for what they are hmm. and to be virtuous. The reason why people like St. Thomas and uh, taking on, taking, building on the scripture treats like drunkenness very seriously hmm. is because the intellect and the will is the highest part of the human person, um, which, much, which most, mostly resembles God. And so therefore when and it's the most noble part of us but when we're so drunk that we cannot make uh, right decisions anymore and we can't reason we we become like we we we, we start to devolve into the animal nature of ourselves uh, yeah. you know we reduce the nobility of who we are hmm. and we start to act out of our animal nature so we're even rejecting that gift of reason yeah because the, the, the even for a moment the intellect yeah. and the will can't function anymore yeah. they're clouded by you know the drunkenness and we're making bad decisions mm. and we're doing so we've reduced the beauty and the nobility of the human person to acting like acting like our acting from our animal nature mm. and he's and, he, and this is why they kind of treat it so kind of you know um harshly sometimes yeah because you know we were made for knowing and loving and and, and this is the highest part of us yeah and, so it, and just to wake up after a night of pure drunkenness and kind of say well, it's fine. I woke up alone in my own bed and, you know, I didn't do yeah, anything didn't stupid any and I only, you know, maybe ate a few too many chips, whatever kind of thing. It's, that's not kind of the, it, it's, it's, it's the fact that we, we entered into that state where, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's getting back yeah. to what we said earlier, yeah. not to strive for mediocrity, to be, how do I, how do mm. I become a saint? How do I become the best person that God created me to be? How do I cooperate and to be that person he created me to be? And it's not just by drifting along life. Hmm. It's it's by striving with hmm. our effort, with our, which ultimately makes us happy. Hmm. You know, it's not, this is the, what the Lord promises us. Happy are those who live like this. Yeah. The Beatitudes, you know, 
And so that's what we have to communicate to people. This is a way of ha- this is going to fulfill you if you live this way. Yeah. We're not saying that you you have to become teetotal overnight and you yeah. can't enjoy the company of your friends anymore and you have yeah. to cut away everything in your life. And yeah. It's about growing in virtue and being moderate and using things for what they were created for. Yeah. And what you find when you start to have the ability to do that, that you start to enjoy those things more intensely. Yeah. So we can you know? still we can, we can enjoy a few beers for yeah just. The beers socializing, and the company and the social yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's it's important to say that as catholics you know it is yeah because we have, a very, we have a very positive understanding of the human person and creation yeah um and maybe some other christian denominations have a more negative understanding of that hmm. so we appreciate creative things yeah. it's about using them virtuously yeah that's the goal for it for us you know because i think yeah it's the same with food and the same with everything yeah. that it's like yeah that that it's <laughs> we can enjoy him that everything isn't just bad like yeah that, that we can yeah we 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 can enjoy life yeah especially yeah. if you want to evangelize young people you know yeah because yeah. maybe they have preconceived ideas oh if i become a christian i have to give up everything yeah, yeah. and i have to do, i certainly there's things you need to cut away in your life yeah but it's not you know but we have a message that actually elevates their life to something yeah something better yeah. Uh, not just the kind of the, the negative side of things. You yeah. Know? So, so yeah, some things we some things we may have to cut off. Other things we may just have to cut back. Yeah. Kind of yeah, moderation as opposed to excess. Spir- spiritual training. Yeah. You know, spiritual yeah. training as you go to the gym with your body. Yeah. Spiritual training of 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 of, of going through these exercises of using yeah. things properly and. Yeah. You know that's what we're that's what we're into. And and then finally, just mm. this, so it's it's as we see that it's. Most likely that yet we can hope mm-hmm. many be saved. It's the teachings of the church, teachings mm-hmm. of the of the teachings of the church show that it's quite difficult mm-hmm. to be an anonymous Christian yeah. and be saved. Yeah. Um that it's uh that that's sixteen C yeah. is, is is that part. And and you know, because sometimes we might kind of feel that well, if someone's another, if someone is a, a Muslim or someone is mm. a, you know, Hindu or something, it's kind of like, oh, well, if we leave them off to their own thing, we don't have to do anything. It's sure, fine. Sure. Luma Gentium says they'll be fine. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of, um, how would you react to that kind of? <laughs> well, if you don't mind, can I read from? Please do, yeah. The, from Lumen Gentium, actually, because, you know, uh, the actual, the actual paragraph and then just kind of finish on that on the conditions yeah um just very quickly so lumen gentium talking here specifically about it, it mentions jews then muslims then um uh, but other people of other religions and so forth and just for anyone who doesn't know lumen gentium it was one of the the second vatican council documents yeah. because i know sometimes the people can think the second vatican council is what changed the church and was all the problems it was whatever which it wasn't yeah, it was you know it this was this is a teaching from the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. This is, yeah, yeah. This it's an ecumenical council yeah. of the church. Yeah. Uh, and in many ways, this is just bringing out, the tr- this is carrying the whole tradition of the church. Mm-hmm. It was certainly kind of nuances and things like that, but an authoritative teaching of the church. So talking about the possibility of salvation for, uh, for, for non-Christians, it says, those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace, try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, those two may achieve eternal salvation. But very often, deceived by the evil one, men have become vain in their reasonings, have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and served the world rather than the creator. Or else living and dying in this world without God, they are exposed to ultimate despair. Hence, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all these, the church, mindful of the Lord's command, preach the gospel to every creature, takes zealous care to foster the missions. Okay, so you see the whole passage mm-hmm. there. And then what we've done, can just to, to finally kind of draw out the key points of yeah. what, so for what the, church is, what the church is saying here for non-Christians to be saved and what it sees in this passage is basically what Ralph Martin does here. He, he extracts what's essential here. Um, non-Christians be not culpable for their ignorance of the gospel. So it says, through no fault of their own, they don't know the gospel. Okay, so that that they're not culpable for that. Okay, they haven't heard the gospel through no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. But the the possibility that they have heard it and rejected it, that's there. That non-Christians seek God with a sincere heart. 
okay, so that they're actually seeking the truth and they're on the way and they're looking towards God and looking for the truth and looking to find it. But the non-Christians try to live their life in conformity with what they know of God's will. And this is typically spoken of as conscience. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to seek God and they're trying to live by the dictates of their conscience, forming their conscience as best as possible to live morally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then finally, the non-Christians welcome or receive whatever good or truth uh, they, they see in their religion as positive elements, as preparation for the gospel. And, and so this passage is making very distinct kind of stipulations so that, that make it quite difficult mm -hmm. in many ways yeah you know if you're if you're not living a life of grace and you've never heard the gospel of christ yet the, the, the council is telling us moved by grace so god's already at work that you're seeking god with a sincere heart that you're actually looking for the the message of the truth that you're living according to your conscience a good moral life and when these conditions are met then a person of a non outside of the full membership of the verse, could be saved. So like, we could be talking about someone who, like Tarzan, grew, grew up in a jungle, mm -hmm. and so never got the gospel. Yep. Um, they are seeking more than just what's kind of our own. They're seeking this kind of, this deeper understanding of life. This, they're, mm. they're seeking God. So they're, then they're also trying to do what is right, living by their conscience, by the light of their conscience, always doing what is right. And that's a kind of a, that's a rarity. You know, yeah, that's, sure that's, that, that's difficult. And that's, yeah. that's to do outside the church. Now, I mean, I can't do that inside the church all the time. You know, I mean, there's because my conscience condemns me for certain actions, you know, from time to time. And that's when I do my examination of conscience mm -hmm. prior to confession, you yeah. know. So, I mean, that that is that is a rarity. And, and so I think, yeah, like like that, that maybe like that, that Ralph Martin speaks about people who. 16a and 16b and mm. without 16c we can kind of say oh yeah so the, the, all these people outside these anonymous christians that they're grand. you know they're fine yeah but it's like but they have to be doing these incredibly difficult yeah. things and so and, 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 there is an urgency it, it, it there paralyzed it paralyzed the missionary activity of the church yeah this understanding the missionaries kind of start to think well what's the point and leaving my homeland and going to these remote areas mm -hmm. if the gospel is already there if grace is already existent in their souls if they just do these things they'll be saved what's the urgency for me to go there mm -hmm. and this is why the last part of that the lumen gentium is so so important mm. you know in that sense and and the grace for us christians for us catholics especially with all the sacraments the god the lord has given us through his providence, the, the, the full sacramental system of the church, that when we fall into our sins, mm -hmm. we can be cleansed and, and healed and restored and so forth. And while at the same time recognizing, as the Council of Trent really importantly stated, God has bound himself to the sacraments, but he's not bound by the sacraments. Mm -hmm. So he can give his grace outside of the sacraments yeah. to a non-Christian who's seeking him and he can his grace can still be at work in them but always as a preparation mm. not for it in itself for it's always in a preparation to as a preparation to move them towards christ mm. and towards the gospel mm. you know and that and that and that's the key mm -hmm. yeah. and 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 then for the the sacrament of reconciliation which confession yeah that is just that because some people they may be watching this they may not have been in quite a long time may not have mm. totally understood it um yeah. and you know that is that that reinstating us back into communion mm. with god back in that 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 channel of of sanctifying grace we're, we're back in that kind of yeah our actions that may have broken that mm -hmm. that that's reinstated that's not just father philip sitting there kind of going i'm wondering what mary is getting up to so <laughs> sure, sure. i want to get all the gossip about what's going on out, the, out in the street yeah that's it's far more than that <laughs> oh absolutely like and I, again i go back to the the prodigal son the prodigal son's a, a beautiful image of confession yeah uh because the the, the son go the son goes away and spurns his inheritance hmm. but when he returns confession returning to the father you're focusing on christ and confession the priest is there as an instrument but you're talking to god this is why it's sacrosanct and the seal is inviolable um you're talking to god 
So when you're reconciled and you admit your faults and you bring that to the Lord, the Father, like in the prodigal son, embraces you and you're in, into his embrace and you're robed again with glory. He puts the robe on the son. You're clothed in charity and in sanctifying grace and in justice. And you're no longer a slave as he mm -hmm. was out there in the world. Mm. And you're no longer a servant. As the son said, if I come back, I can just be a hired hand or a servant. Mm -hmm. The father's embrace elevates you to an adopted child, once again, an inheritor of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. All I have is yours, he says to the older son. And this is the beauty of confession. This is what happens in our soul, mm -hmm. which takes place. You know, and so it's so we, we're so focused on our sins that we forget the, what we receive from it. We receive all these gifts of grace and of virtue and and, and, and from the Lord and the ability not to be fall into our weaknesses so often we erode those kind of abilities through the grace that we receive from the sacrament over and over again and so mm. it's a beautiful sacrament you know the priest is just an instrument he shouldn't be the focus and, and you shouldn't be afraid of the uh, of yeah. the priest he it, it's the lord you're talking to and what i love as well about the, the prodigal son that story as well is that as he you know comes back and the father mm. and he runs to meet him as the son goes to speak he's not like shh yeah no need to say anything mm. it's fine it's forgotten yeah the son, or the father, still allows him to speak and say, "Father, mm. you know, I've sinned, you know, yeah, over yeah, you. Yeah. and 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 he and then as soon as that is mentioned, as soon as the confession is made, mm. it's like, yeah, yeah, fine, come on in, sure, sure. It's like you know, it's not this. Well, there's this punishment or that one. You know, it's kind of like it's mm. not. You're fine, come, yeah. come. So it's it is it is that making that that mm. that confession, and it's yeah. So so basically, it's will many be saved? The book suggests not that well well it depends ultimately on, we don't know ultimately we don't know is right <laughs> okay. but but well, we but this yeah we can we can hope but yeah. but ultimately um it kind of it it suggests that interpretation of jesus teachings and things like that that um it, perhaps not but mm -hmm. It's not bad news. It's not all bad news. It's it's a case that you know it's not to be sitting there in fear and trembling, kind of going that mm -hmm. I'm in trouble because you know Mary next door is better than me and she's one of the few, you know, kind of thing. Sure, it's sure. it is a case that God desires mm -hmm. everybody yeah. to be saved, their own, their own, and, and and has given that grace. Yeah, people's free choices and free actions mm -hmm. hamper that he has given confessions uh he's given the sacrament confession for us to to come back in line and mm -hmm. and so that's i suppose that's another one not only about making you know jesus present on the altar it's another one of the incredible gifts that that priests can do mm -hmm. is to to hear this and to be able to restore people back to into communion with god sure. And 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 so there's there's no fear in going to confession. There's no judgment there from from the mm -hmm. side of the priest, and and it's then to go and spread that good news. Absolutely. Yeah. So, God is calling you. God is calling every single person, right at this moment, every moment of every day, you know. And this is what this is what we're saying. And when we're talking about salvation and so forth, and um, we we look to the Lord what He taught, and and we hope. And we hope that people will respond to that grace because there's so much at stake. Mm. And this is the seriousness. There's great urgency in preaching the truth and preaching the gospel and charity because people's eternal souls are at stake. And that's what it boils down to. We have to be, we have to we talk about that. Then all the little conditions and where people are in their lives and only God can see the soul of a person and how they've reached that position and so forth. But from our perspective, the onus is on us just to preach the gospel as the Lord told us mm. and to tell the urgency of it that people know about this and they know the truth and they know the love of Christ. And then ultimately when it comes to when a soul presents itself to God at death, that's that's beyond our, we don't know how God deals with that soul. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately how, why the church would never define if someone's in hell because ultimately we don't know yeah. in, in that moment. But what we do know is the, what the Lord asked us to do. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So thanks very God much for joining us. All. Pleasure. So you might just finish with a, a little prayer and a blessing for, for us and our viewers. So. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for sending us your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as our Saviour and Redeemer, by offering us the gift of salvation, by offering us his grace that transforms our human nature 
and elevates us and brings us into relationship with you and the Trinity. What a wonderful grace. Help us never to spurn this great gift that you have given us. We pray for all people. We pray for all those who at this moment are finding it difficult in life and especially in faith to believe. We pray that your grace will be triumphant in their souls and through the witnesses of your Christians and for those who profess to be followers of your son, they may see the face of Christ and become um, one with him and be welcomed into the embrace of you, Father. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Thanks, Father. Thank you.